In this lecture, I will talk about the problem of long branch attraction in phylogenetics, and I will use an example to show how long branch attraction can occur. Let's start by going over the important points that I'll be talking about. First, I will discuss the fact that taxa can vary in the rates of changes in their character states. Additionally, I will address that changes in character states can cause homoplasies to occur. Recall that homoplasies are similarities, so sharing the same character state, but that similarity not resulting from shared descent. Fourth, we will discuss the fact that a high rate of homoplasy relative to synapomorphies can cause phylogenetic algorithms to group species incorrectly. Recall that synapomorphies are shared character states that occur by virtue of descent from an, a common ancestor with that trait. Next, we will talk about the fact that the problem of long branch attraction is not solved simply by having larger data sets, in other words, um, longer DNA sequences or more um, genes in the analysis. In fact, the more loci you have, arguably the problem could get worse. Additionally, we will talk about the fact that long branch attraction is not solved by bootstrapping. Our level of confidence might be still inflated if we bootstrap our results, um, but long branch attraction could still be occurring. So bootstraps are not a solution to the problem. Finally, I'll talk a little bit about solutions to the problem, which include techniques that take into account um, lineages that have high rates of changes in character states. So that's where we're going. Now let's cover it in depth um, point by point. First, consider that taxa can vary in their rate of character state changes. And to show this, I have four um, boringly named taxa, alpha, beta, Charlie and Delta, and this is our character by taxon matrix, characters going down the columns, and our four, um, or characters in different rows, and our four taxa each in their own column. And what we can see here is, let's imagine the true history at some point well in the past. And what we can see, just to make the example easy, is that all taxa have character state A, um, so in A, G, C, and T, then um, one of our four base pairs for all of the loci. This will just make it easier for us to see where changes arise. Additionally, in this made up example, let's imagine that Charlie and Delta have a shared common ancestor and that common ancestor had a change from A to T in locus one. They, both Charlie and Delta inherited the T, and so in this, again, made-up example, the T is a synapomorphy. It is a character state that has been inherited by virtue of descent in a change from a common ancestor. And so in this example, this will be the only true phylogenetic signal. This should tell us that Charlie and Delta are going to group together because they have a shared synapomorphy. Obviously, in the real analysis, we'd have both more data and hopefully more synapomorphies, but I think this will help illustrate the point. What we're going to do now is introduce um, a change in Charlie and Delta that allows them to randomly have changes in their loci. And so with some, in this example, reasonably high probability, they will both experience mutations. Importantly, those mutations are all going to be independent. Um, and I, I think I just misspoke. I think I said Charlie and Delta would both have high rates of changes. But instead of that, it's going to be Beta and Charlie that both have a propensity to accumulate mutations. So they are going to have a high rate of changes over time. And again, these are going to be independent changes. What happens in beta has no effect on what happens in Charlie and vice versa. 
these changes are all accumulating after these species have already diverged. What we can see on the right is what the character by taxon matrix looks like after some long period of time, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or more years. We still see that shared synapomorphy between Charlie and Delta at the very top. However, we now see a bunch of new character states in both Beta and in Charlie. So it's pretty clear in this example that they've had a high rate of change. We can also see that while many of those changes are unique or not shared between Beta and Charlie, such as this change in trait two and three and four, et cetera, some of the changes just by coincidence are the same. And this is going to happen anytime there's a very limited number of traits that can occur at a particular locus. And with DNA sequence data, there's always only four, A, C, G, or T. And so that means just by chance when there are changes, some of the time those changes are going to end up leading to the same uh, character state. And we can see three examples of that in this character by taxon matrix. Here at locus seven, we have two parallel, well, two changes to G. In locus 10, we have the same. And in locus 19, we have two independent changes to C. Because these are independent changes not inherited by virtue of common descent, then we can call these homoplasies. So we have three homoplasies that are the same between Beta and Charlie. This would be convergence. We still have that one synapomorphy between Charlie and Delta, and that was our true signal. But what we can see is that that true signal is now being outnumbered by these false similarities or homoplasies. We can now look at the same thing and think about this on what it would look like on an unrooted network. Um, this is you know, basically an unrooted phylogeny that we could make into a phylogeny if we just assign an outgroup and root it. This example, by the way, does not correspond to the uh, table of the character by taxon matrix I just showed you. So don't try to go back and look for these specific numbers. In this example, we see something similar. We have four species, A, B, C, and D. And let's imagine what we're looking at here is the true unrooted network. Um, so what actually happened? A and B have um, a closer relationship or link, and C and D are the ones that should be more closely linked. Let's also assume that the only change here that is going to be a synapomorphy is represented on this connection between the node connecting AB and the node connecting CD. And it's a change between A and T. Um, maybe the, the um, taxa on the left have A, the taxa on the right have T at character state two. All of these other changes are changes that we know um, because we somehow have access to the actual history. All of these other changes happened in each individual lineage. So these are all changes in taxon C. There's no phylogenetic signal um, associated with these. These are akin to aut apomorphies or at least they should be, any change in an individual lineage cannot provide information about relationships. The same thing is true over here with these many changes in the lineage leading to taxon A. Several changes, they are not by shared descent similar to any other changes on here, and so they really should not be telling us anything about phylogenetic relationships. However, we can see that these independent changes happen to be the same in both lineages. They happen separately, but by coincidence, they are the same. And so there's a change here from T to A in um, locus seven for both A and C. There also happens to be the similarity in locus 14 
a change from C to G in both of these two lineages. So we now have again another illustration of homoplasies outnumbering um, traits that can actually give us information about relationships. We have this one trait two that should be our only informative trait in theory, but we have two pairs of homoplasies in trait seven and 14 that are giving us incorrect information. Um, and you can see the source from which I modified this diagram uh, below. So if we have two traits telling us about homoplasies and only one giving us accurate information, then the false information from the homoplasies is going to outweigh the true signal from that one trait that should be a synapomorphy for two of these taxa. That's a problem when we try to create this, um, this network. Because remember, what I'm showing you here is the network as it actually should be, but if, or the true unrooted network, we somehow again, in that example, had access to what actually happened. However, if all we had was that data from this um, slide, and we tried to reconstruct the network, we would get the wrong result. Instead of having C and D linked to one node and A and B linked to the other node, as we did in the true network based on some, some access to actual historical information, when we reconstruct the network, we now have A and C, those two lineages with long branches connected to one node, and we have B and D, the two lineages that had no changes or few changes connected to the other node. So this is where we can see in a more uh, visual sense, attraction between long branches. A and C have been attracted to a node together by virtue of the homoplasies that happen to be shared between them. A misconception that many students have is that bootstrap support will tell us whether long branch attraction is happening. And if we have high bootstrap support, we can have high confidence. Therefore, we don't have to worry about long branch attraction. Unfortunately, that is not correct. So first recall what is bootstrapping. It's a method of assessing confidence in phylogenies, and it does so by randomly selecting a subset of loci, and some loci are selected repeatedly to make new data sets the data sets then are subjected to the same phylogenetic analysis, and we see whether particular clades show up in both our uh, original data and our bootstrapped data. The more that the same clades show up in the randomized data sets that also show up in our actual data set, then the more support we say the phylogeny from our actual data set has. So that's bootstrapping in a nutshell. What we're seeing here is that because of, or, or rather when there are long branches, then bootstrapping is going to tend to give us the same result that our original analysis did. And hence it is going to give us false confidence that our original analysis is correct. Let's think about why that is. Remember that we have a few um, homoplasies here by virtue of independent changes in Beta and Charlie. There was one here in seven, one in 12, and one down in 19. When we make our bootstrapped data set, we're going to randomly draw loci. And there's a reasonable chance that we are going to draw some of these loci that have the homoplasies with the wrong information. In fact, there's an equal chance for each one of those homoplasies of, of being drawn as there is of our true synapomorphy up here in locus one. Since we have more homoplasies than we do synapomorphies in this um, invented example, our bootstraps are going to tend to pick up the homoplasies on average more than our synapomorphy, and they are going to tend to support the idea that Beta and Charlie are more closely related because they are going to misjudge these homoplasies as being synapomorphies. 
So our bootstraps are going to end up showing Beta and Charlie close together, just as our original analysis did, and we are no better off. Our high confidence in our phylogeny will actually be um, uh, not, not because it's the true relationship. So it's going to be spurious confidence in that relationship. So how can we actually solve long branch attraction? I am not going to try to give a technical answer here, but the, the basic approach is that any analyses that are performed, um, so any algorithms that are reconstructing phylogenies need to be able to account for different rates of changes in character states among taxa. And specifically, they need to be able to discount changes in lineages that have a high rate of change. Because as we've just seen, those lineages with a high rate of change are the ones that are most likely to have spurious or to have homoplasies that appear to be synapomorphies. Parsimony analysis is unable to do this. It's unable to discount changes in lineages with high rates of change. And so that is going to be a problem if we are trying to use parsimony on something like DNA sequence data, which only has four possible character states for each character. Other techniques such as maximum likelihood are able to account for different rates of change and to discount the changes in lineages with a high rate of change. And so they are likely to be less affected by long branch attraction. However, this does not mean that likelihood and similar techniques are going to be perfect. Um, the corrections can be imperfect or even overcorrective, and hence they can overly discount those long branches. And so even in these alternative techniques besides parsimony, it is necessary to consider whether long branch attraction is affecting the results. If we go back to our overview, you should now see that we talked about how taxa can have different rates of character state changes. These can lead to homoplasy. Homoplasies, of course, are not um, what we want to build phylogenies on because they are not based on similarities by shared descent. Homoplasies can outweigh synapomorphies and can cause species to be grouped incorrectly on networks or phylogenies. The problem is not solved by just having more loci because that'll just give more opportunities for homoplasies to occur. The problem is not solved by bootstrapping because bootstrapping will pick up on those same homoplasies that cause a, pr a problem in the actual data set. And the only solution to this problem, or at least a solution to this problem, is to use analyses that take into account rates of character state changes so they can discount the changes in lineages that have a high rate. There are some other um, approaches to solving this problem too, um, relating to which taxa are included in the analysis, for example. But um, I will leave my summary of this topic here.